So, dobrý večer. Good evening. Uh, good evening, everyone. It seems the room is full, almost. Uh, so, I guess we're ready to start. My name is uh, Přemysl Salta. I'm director of the Czech Center. I'm really delighted to welcome so many of you in this magnificent historical building, which is a home of the Royal Institutions. Uh, institution. Well, first, I like really to give a credit to uh, Lisa Deary. She's here with us uh, because we started the collaboration with the Royal Institutions already three years ago, and we kicked it off a, a series, a debate series called Science Cafe, on the topic of AI, artificial intelligence. Uh, and the first speaker was, you might recall, perhaps maybe some of you were in this very room, uh, was Mikhail Pekocek. He is the expert on security. Uh, today he is the chief technology officer in the, the world largest anti antivirus company. Of course, we had the COVID, we had many events online, and I'm very happy to be back here in person in continuations of the discussions on, on AI. So today's presentation titled uh, Species Survival, How AI Can Help uh, Conservation, will tackle perhaps uh, one of the most imminent humankind objective, which is how to protect and save nature and the living habitat. So these topics of sustainability and innovations are increasingly becoming incremental part of the Czech Center programming, including this year 26th edition of the Made in Prague Festival, which is one of the oldest national culture festival in London and, and UK. So on the same topic uh, of sustainability, I really would like also to invite you to the ongoing augmented reality interactive exhibition, which uh, Innovation for Sustainable Future, which is on display in the Europe House, uh, very close to the, to the Westminster. So now, without any further ado, I really would like to introduce one of the leading thinkers uh, on advanced technology and nature protection, Jonathan Ledgard. Jonathan is a fellow of Prague uh, Artificial Intelligence Center and he is also a visiting professor at the Czech uh, Techno Technical University. Though currently, as many of you do know, he resides in Nairobi in Kenya where most of his research is being carried out. I shall also state that Jonathan had a very prolific uh, career as a journalist, uh, spending 18 years as a foreign correspondent in uh, for economists uh, in over 60 countries, of course, including uh, Prague and the Czech uh, Republic. And last but not least, he's also an accomplished writer. His book, Submergence and Giraffe, has been awarded the best books of the year on the both sides of the Atlantic, including the New York uh, Times. So, uh, oh, bravo. Uh, I just like to say uh, that after the presentation, uh, discussion, and Q&A will, will follow. I'm very pleased that it will be chaired uh, by Henry Mans, so that he's the, the chief feature writer of the Financial Times, and by himself also accomplished author of a very successful book, I believe you can see it right here, uh, at least from the first couple of rows, How to Love Animals. So thank you for coming, and I wish you inspirational and intellectual stimulating evening. Jen, uh, thank you. Or is yours. Thank you. Bravo, exactly. Um, um, it's really good to be here, and, and uh, it's great to see uh, friends, family, and uh, colleagues, um, and hopefully future friends and future colleagues. Um, I just want to thank the Royal Institution. Um, uh, thank you, the Queen Manoho Klaas, um, for your generosity. Um, as you mentioned, uh, I'm a visiting professor at the Czech Technical University. Um, and it, it's obviously, uh, Prague is 
uh, where the word robot was coined, a Czech word. And it's worth um, pointing out that the Czechs, like the British, are among the lead in artificial intelligence. Um, I'm going to go uh, fairly quickly through my talk because A, I'm, I'm very aware that you know, it's, it's a Tuesday evening in London uh, and, and B, I want uh, Henry and I to, to engage in a conversation and obviously to hear your questions. Um, okay, uh, I just want to start with a couple of very quick caveats. Um, this lecture obviously is going to dwell on non-humans, uh, but it's worth remembering that the life of humans is often difficult. Uh, as of last week, there are 8 billion people uh, on the planet, and uh, I met these children uh, recently in the remote part of Africa. Uh, they were in a community that had been uh, flooded, um, and they were very hungry. Uh, the girl there was looking after her sisters, and I don't think they'd eaten for two or three days. Um, in, in a community such as this, um, where girls are having their first child at 13 or 14 years old, um, the question is less about choice than it is about survival. The second caveat um, is about acceleration and speed. Um, I like to use uh, the analogy of uh, tennis to describe this. Um, if we can imagine uh, that we were lucky enough to play tennis with Rafael Nadal and uh, he was going to serve the ball to us. Um, and he was even going to tell us exactly the spot that he was going to serve the ball. And then we swing, but the ball is already past us and hit the back fence. Um, and, and that, I think, is the situation that we find ourselves uh, as a species at the moment. And everything that we discussed this evening, uh, human, non-human, and particularly uh, in relation to machine intelligence, is going incredibly fast. Okay, the central question that I want to ask in, in this lecture is this. Uh, in what way should artificial intelligence take account of the 8 million non-human species on Earth? Should we use AI to recognize, interpret, and protect these beings? Should we teach AI what it is to be corporeal, like this lamb here? Or should we simply exclude animals, trees, insects, and all the others from emergent planetary scale computing on the grounds that this human architecture is wholly unsuitable for them? Whatever we answer, we face an existential risk. Because if we choose to direct AI towards nature, to commingle with it, we may issue into the world new relationships between machines and other species that are beyond our control and comprehension. But if we fail, to so direct AI, it may evolve away from the living world and become incurious and inconsiderate of biological life. At least that life which is not necessary to functionally service the biosphere. And so we may lose our last best chance of avoiding mass, mass extinction events. This is a question uh, to which there is not yet any answer, because what we are framing here tonight is a novel idea. We might be at the very beginning 
of a new age of attentiveness, where other species we share the world with come more clearly into focus for us. But it is also possible that the harder we look, the more unknowable nature becomes. Willingly or not, however, we have entered into the interspecies age. As Shemek mentioned, I'm a novelist, and as a novelist I've been circling around this question for a long while without knowing it. Uh, my first novel was an attempt to meditate on what it is to be a non-human life form in our world, and my second dealt, in part, with microbial life in the deep ocean. My quite separate work as a technologist um, involves AI and robotics. It is futuristic, but intended to scale in emerging economies. Here, too, I find myself often drawn towards nature. But when I developed this idea of uh, medical delivery uh, by drone for Africa, um, I prefer to think of the future of these drones, uh, flying robots, as somewhat like uh, geese, something beautiful and natural and simple in the sky. In my lifetime, the number of wild animals on Earth has halved. Most of us are aware that we are entering a moment, a moment perhaps common to all planets with sentient life, where we will either make it through or we will blink out. A few years ago, I walked through a wilderness in South Sudan with a group of gunmen. It was a trackless waste the size of Switzerland. Dangerous, hard, very hot, and the few people we found out there were dying. <coughs> On the march, we came across a tiny orphaned gazelle. The little animal was weak and hungry. I carried it in my arms for several kilometers. It kicked for a while, then became heavy, in just the way an infant does. The men, wanted to eat it. They wanted to eat everything. But as the calf was passed between them, as they each in turn carried it, I saw how its living presence altered their mood and compelled them to protect it. When we rested, one of the men stirred powdered milk into water in his tin cup. The gazelle was too weak to stand, but it drank hungrily its little plastic nose moistened. We pitched camp that night in an exposed open place so that the men could see attackers coming from far away. We laid down thorn branches to keep out the lions and drew a circle of ash from the fire which crawling insects were loath to cross. In the dark, I checked on the gazelle. It stared back at me with large, vacant, glassy eyes. It was alive, but quaking. I felt sure it would die in the night. Ah. But the next morning, I found it standing. It had survived. The point here is that nature is often more resilient than we give it credit for. Regeneration is possible, so are new relationships. But I saw another reality a few days later when we emerged finally from the bush onto a remote stretch of the Nile. Between the wilderness and the river was a new gravel road. All the animals had to cross the road to drink. They walked along that road before dawn, stepping over roadkill, carcass after carcass, some fresh, some maggoty, even a giraffe. There was a sweet-smelling mist over the papyrus marsh, but the road was choked with dust 
thrown up by lorries carrying food aid, which roared out of the darkness every 20 minutes or so. At one point, I saw two young antelopes trying to cross back to the wilderness after drinking at night by the river. I watched as they moved up the grassy bank and then wandered very lightly out into the middle of the road. I willed them across, but they were uncertain. They were so wild, and they were paralysed by the headlights and the roar of the lorry, and were smashed apart with such violence that I can only describe it as an explosion. Keep this in mind as we move into the abstract territory of computing. We will keep moving as a species. We will continue to lay down complex systems that densify and seek out value. And these systems will often have lethal outcomes. What are we talking about when we talk about AI? Simply, oops, sorry. Simply, AI is intelligence made by machines. This machine intelligence is separate from biological intelligence. It introduces entirely new thoughts into the world. Most AI is narrow. That is, it is designed to solve exactly one problem, such as optimizing departures on the London Underground. But if we take a 10 or 20 year view and are concerned with the persistence of diverse life on our planet, we must pay particular attention to the arrival of artificial general intelligence. Theoretically, at least, AGI represents an intelligence explosion which is significantly disconnected from biological evolution. It will have the ability to reason across several domains and carry out tasks to human or even superhuman ability. We will certainly have forms of AGI in this decade which will be, which will be able to see and to hear, to answer complex questions, to manipulate objects, and possibly even to touch and smell. And I say this with confidence because the preparatory work in what is known as unsupervised learning already exists in the public domain. And what is hidden from view is likely to be more advanced. Do we even have a choice about engaging with AI? In my opinion, probably not. As the engineer and polymer James Lovelock noted, Escaping the technosphere on spaceship Earth is as fanciful as jumping off a ship in the mid-Atlantic and seeking to swim ashore. Consider the progress made here in London by DeepMind, uh, a division of Google. DeepMind was founded in 2010 with a mission of developing human-level AGI. It regards AGI as, quote, the ultimate general purpose tool to help us understand the universe. The company has developed systems that learn to play chess, Go, and arcade games. Crucially, these systems start with zero knowledge and achieve grandmaster status in just a few hours of play. This slide shows DeepMind's greatest achievement to date, called AlphaFold, an AI which folds and unfolds proteins. This newfound ability to manipulate the building blocks of life is, in the words of one of my sources at DeepMind, going to blow the lid on everything. But the company regards it only as a starting point, as a proof of concept for much larger projects on aging, universal translation, energy, and propulsion systems. But for the purposes of our talk, there is a problem. 
DeepMind and the 20 to 30 similarly funded initiatives in the world are trying to solve for what we call the massive combinatorial search space. That means, essentially, holding on to subjects like chemistry or language for which you have massive data sets which can be more easily quantified and optimized. DeepMind says it wants to, quote, solve intelligence in order to advance science. Given the complexity and ethical concerns of birthing sentience into our world, that seems reasonable. But then again, in the context of species extinction and the potential of our collapsing biosphere, it is also unreasonable and lacking in invention. AGI initiatives, in my opinion, should devote significant resources to seeing other species, to identifying them, and to copying their traits, for precisely the reason that their existence is under threat. Of course, this demand presents its own set of problems. It is not at all clear what computation means in a living rainforest in Sierra Leone, which we see above, with its red ironwood trees, its pygmy hippos, and its bush babies. Perhaps it is helpful to go back to relatively basic forms of AI, AI that exists in the world, and to think about the ways that these can contribute to conservation efforts. Only one million of the 8.2 million species on Earth have been named. We don't know the traits of all these unknown species. And because of that, we really don't know much about life on Earth. But the first easy win for AI is to collect the knowledge that we already do have and to machine learn that knowledge. Here we see a project at the Museum for Natural History in Berlin an AI robot system records 500,000 insects from their collection. The museum director, perhaps Professor Johannes Vogel, who is a fellow traveler on the interspecies, says the purpose of digitization is simply to know what we need to protect. However, a melancholy element to this particular work is that several of the species of moths, ants, and butterflies, which were gathered long ago and held in dusty drawers in the museum, have already disappeared from our planet. We are ignorant even about animals. No one has ever seen a dugong mating. We are not even sure how these sea cows do it, but we will soon know. Straw-colored fruit bats, such as this one, are the most numerous and widespread animal in Africa. Oops. Excuse me. They seed many, perhaps most, of the hardwood trees across the Congolese rainforest and into West Africa. The fruit bat flies 60 to 70 kilometers and love bombs seeds down in a great glutinous rain, mixing up the genetics of the trees. Bats are highly vocal, always signaling their intentions in high-pitched sh shrieks. These calls can be broken down by AI, and that in turn may help us to understand the collective intelligence of colonies of tens of thousands of bats, which move outwards in the rainy season following a green wave, a process which has renewed the jungle since long before humans evolved. We do not have time now to unpack all the ways in which AI will change our experience of sound emanating from a natural world. For those interested, I do recommend a new book called The Sounds of Life by Professor Karen Baker, of the University of British Columbia. In this book, Professor Baker highlights how AI will make us more aware 
of the infrasound chorus, of which we have as humans no experience, but by which mice, beetles, plants, and many other species communicate. Then there is the question of language. It is reasonable to hope that we will soon be able to use AI to understand what certain species are saying. In other words, universal translation may cross the species divide. Among the most advanced work um, uh, is the work being done by groups studying sperm whales. The intricate clicks called coders of the sperm whale are considered to be among the most subtle communication of any non-human earth creature. There is a crossover here with the search for extraterrestrial life. Since astrobiologists think that by learning animal language, we will be steeled for our first contact with alien species. And they point out that if the, the coda of a sperm whale was broadcast back to us from space, we would certainly think it an intelligent alien species. It is worth emphasizing here, as we noted with dugongs, how a suite of sensory technologies come together to create new insights. In this case, robots in the sky, robots in the water, underwater microphones supplying raw audio that is then separated and eventually understood. Indeed, AI in the wild is possible only because cheap hardware is available. Another interspecies backer, Professor Martin Vukelski of the Max Planck Institute, uses sensors like this to track birds, African wild dogs, fossa, and many other species. They are low cost, less than 20 pounds to fit and operate, and the availability of bandwidth on new fleets of low orbit satellites will show us more clearly how animals move through this world. And what is true in the sea and in space is even more so in the rainforest. There a smorgasbord of AI projects is at play. You can just make out here the sensor array set high in the canopy. It is a simple means of getting an accurate and ongoing assessment of birds, insects, primates, frogs, and every other vocal animal. And this particular system is designed also to detect the sound of gunshots and chainsaws, which is useful where you want to limit human activity. A further area which I'm personally involved with and very excited about, where we can expect to advance, is identity. Not all species need an individual digital identity, but primates are so few in number, so harried, and often cut up for bushmeat, that personage for them may sometimes be helpful. Orangutans diverged from humans about 17 million years ago. Despite many efforts, they are declining in much of their range. And here, to put face to them, from left to right are the separate Bornean, Sumatran, <coughs> and Tapanuli species. A team led by Professor Serge Litch of Liverpool John Moores University is hoping to extend face recognition technology similar to that found in smartphones to orangutans in the wild. Chimpanzee face recognition experiments are already achieving more than 80% accuracy, and the process will certainly be extended to all of the great apes. <coughs> then there is traditional safari conservation. Uh, these national parks and conservancies are often fenced off and sometimes patrolled by armed rangers. I would single out in this field the work of the Earth Ranger platform 
of the Allen Institute for AI. Paul Allen, alas, dead, uh, was a founder of uh, Microsoft, and his estate is very likely to take the lead in developing AI solutions relevant for the interspecies. Earth Ranger uh, already provides prediction tools which help protect elephants and rhinos from poachers. Not all of this kind of surveillance involves AI, but this is likely to change as Earth Ranger evolves away from the large control rooms of places like Kruger National Park in South Africa and is instead placed on apps on cheap Android phones which communities can engage with. I want to take a moment now to reflect on the possible ways that we as individuals, even living far away, can be drawn closer to other species. The metaverse has been misconceived at its outset by Facebook, and is certainly a long way off. Nevertheless, it is likely that we humans will spend more and more of our time in alternate immersive realities. Given that over 40% of the human population identifies as biophiliac, interspecies augmented reality, which lays down another layer of experience on our surroundings, may become more widespread. <coughs> Here, my colleague Gautam Shah of the game developer Internet of Elephants envisages new ways of experiencing wildlife. And this layering is already happening in unexpected ways. For instance, several hundred thousand users have downloaded Gautam's Adidas running app um, and run against mountain lions, snow leopards, and even pangolins. Interspecies groups are mushroom, mush, mushrooming. Gosh, that's a hard word to say. Some, like the Earth Species Project uh, and the Interspecies Internet, and give me a shout out there to Jeremy, are focused on cracking animal language. And others, such as the Dutch Sovereign Nature Initiative, are looking at new forms of governance for animals. These groups will inevitably become more political in our contested near future. And while some will seek to bend planetary computing towards all life forms on Earth, others will head off in a militantly offline direction. Still, it is likely, in my opinion, that interspecies will become a subculture in its own right, drawing on art, music, veganism, and animal rights to extend the circle of empathy. And for some, the circle will also include machine intelligence and robots. <clears throat> this is Leonardo da Vinci's interspecies painting, Lady with an Ermine. I think Leonardo wanted here to make both the woman and the creature more alive to the viewer. The Ermine here is a being. She exists in the world, and she's not a piece of fur lining the cloak of a nobleman. This painting was an inspiration for the demons in Philip Pullman's eponymous trilogy, His Dark Materials. In Pullman's parallel world, people have an animal with whom they can share their lives and which carries some mixing of their soul. Some AI researchers think quite seriously that AGI may eventually settle on something close to Pullman's vision, in which everyone has an agent embodied like an animal, something that is engineered, yes, but also living and natural. Indeed, the greatest service AI may give us is to remind us that the world is stacked with many intelligences. And while today we delight in the AI which plays computer games, 
Tomorrow, our appreciation may be reserved for the intelligence of a termite colony. Of course, money matters in this discussion. AI is expensive and is directed to where it can generate profit. Here in the tropics, the poorest and fastest growing communities live closest to the richest biodiversity. Yet they receive no reward for that. Unless there is a 50-fold increase in conservation spending in such communities, many species simply will not survive until the middle of the century. AI is built by humans for the human economy. If you want to design foundation models that represent an ecosystem computationally, if we really want to see other species and to protect them, we will need to feed in colossal amounts of data and to do this perpetually. This is the basis for my idea of interspecies money. On the one hand, a redistributive income scheme for poorer communities, and on the other, those same communities generate the data necessary for training future machine intelligences. A rare life form in interspecies money receives a secure digital identity. For some species, face recognition will suffice. And with this identity, it has the ability to hold and spend money for its own survival. I envisage quite seriously several billion dollars a year flowing in interspecies money from central banks to other species and back to poorer communities. And some of these central banks are already taking this idea seriously. This week, for instance, the Reserve Bank of India is taking interspecies money into consideration in the development of its digital rupee. In this simple example, obviously a giraffe close to my heart, um, the giraffe has a digital identity and a wallet. It pays the community to become better known over time and also pays to limit poaching and charcoal burning and for planting trees and for repairing waterholes. Eventually the giraffe might finance its own veterinary care and invest in renewable energy for the village. Crucially, under interspecies money, the non-human participates in the human economy not as we mentioned before, through the accrued value of its body parts, but as something living, something like Leonardo's ermine. One final point before we open up to discussion, and I think this is very relevant to Henry's book and thinking. Um, wild animals make up only 4.4% of the mammal biomass on Earth. The rest of the biomass is human, dogs and cats, but most especially livestock bred for milk, wool or meat. It is a very bitter truth that by far the most advanced AI developed for animals exists only in Chinese pig farms and slaughterhouses. AI inputs in industrial farming can improve animal welfare. They can lead to less stress, less disease. A researcher I know at MIT is building an AI vocalizer to play soothing hen sounds to unhatched chicks in factory farms. But for the most part, there is just butchery. To summarize, Machine intelligence is getting more powerful and widely distributed. It can be applied 
towards nature if we care to make that investment. We cannot yet say for sure how it should be directed. My interest is to mobilize significant intellectual and financial capital in order to begin to find a way forward. Whatever we choose, we should try to act with compassion, while being aware that compassion may not be enough. This dugong calf named Mariam was rescued in Thailand, an orphan just like my gazelle. She briefly became a Thai internet sensation until she died a few days later from shock and swallowing plastic. Thank you very much. I suppose one of the themes that, that comes out to me, um, and often when we think about our relationship with other species, but brought out by your, your talk, is that our impact on them is often not the cruelty of the past, not the, you know, the deliberate infliction of suffering, not the... Uh, a deliberate lack of respect for animal souls, um, but it's a thoughtlessness. And in the development of this uh, very powerful and, and far-reaching technology in, in terms of machine learning and, and potentially the path towards artificial general intelligence, there seems to be a, a thoughtlessness about how, what that means for other species. And I wonder whether you, you've, you've given some, some great examples of the avenues people have gone down in terms of trying to, to make the link. But what do you think is the mainstream view within the tech industry? What do you think uh, is the, the, the approach of, of those at the heart of AI towards other species? Have they just not thought about the implications or are they resistant to it? Do they see it as a sort of human-centered technology? Well, I, I think in, indicative of that is uh, Stanford University um, produced a report a couple of years ago um, called the 100 Year history of, uh, you know, it was a prediction of AI, where AI is going to be in 100 years time. And it was an enormous report, and it, and it was called The Nature of AI. And it was 200 pages long, and it didn't mention the natural world or other species once, you know. So it had nature in its title, but <laughs> there was no reference, reference at all uh, to the natural world. Um, as I mentioned about DeepMind, um, animals don't have any money, trees don't have money, and AI is incredibly expensive to put together. You, 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 know, you need the data sets, then you need the programmers, and, and generally you, you need a payback for it. So in the AI space, the only progress that we see is um, a kind of uh, progress with Microsoft and some other companies uh, towards what we call planetary computing, which is basically let, let's try and count the number of trees, um, identify your fresh water sources. But what is frustrating about that is that still remains quite utilitarian. And what you tend to find is that animals are not really included in that and 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 if animals are included then other beings uh, as as we mentioned you know because my, my abiding interest with interspecies money is definitely going to be moving towards you know trees plants insects even microbial life and those are not represented at all in in that uh, system at the moment Great. I want to come on to a, um, a few of the uh, specific um, applications you mentioned. And just to say that uh, um, I have a, f uh, a few qu uh, questions of my own for Jonathan, and then uh, we're going to open the discussion up so, uh, and take questions from the audience. Um, uh, so um, please do get sort of uh, thinking and brewing. I want to say that there is a, often these, these debates about, um, about powerful future technologies fall into a utopianism or a dystopianism or people feel very strongly uh, favourable or, or unfavourable towards them. And at the moment, that seems to be uh, nicely correlated with whether people are positive about Elon Musk's takeover of Twitter or negative 
And I know that one of the reasons that you can come up with these interesting thoughts is that you don't engage with social media. So, uh, but I want you to, uh, to place yourself on... I mean, when you think of the future of, um, uh, of AI and, and the interspecies, I mean, do you come at it from the, the, the position of someone who is, uh, who is naturally positive about technology or naturally sceptical, or are you, are you seeking to, to harness the utopianism of others? Or how, how, do you, how do you put yourself on the spectrum? Um, uh, I, I think it's very, you know, obviously you saw that first slide with the young uh, girls in, in, in the village. So there's no, there's no, there's no scenario where um, uh, advanced technology is going to lift extreme poverty. Um, but, but I do think I, I'm incredibly bullish about the application of it. Um, in the wild, provided that we can get the financial structures right. So I think it's the acquisition of data is a really big, difficult problem, you know. So when, when you're actually out there in nature, you know, very, very little information is filtering back um, to us. It's just a few scientists. They go out once every two years. Um, they're, they're not... There's no... There's no baseline on our planet in the wild, you know. So uh, I think on the technology side, absolutely, yeah, I'm, I'm super bullish. Um, but somebody's going to pay for it, and that's why the financial mechanism, I think, is really critical. Well, let, let's let's talk about the language question. So I think you know, if you when you hear about it the first time, you think, well, you know, we've all used Google Translate, and um, it's made us feel that we didn't need to learn uh, languages at all in our in our youth. Um, and it's, it's that powerful and that great. And people say, well, why don't you just apply that to, uh, to the Wales Coda or, or whatever it might be? So it, it's a really hard problem. It goes well beyond uh, Wales, but also uh, sort of well beyond the, you know, what you're looking at in terms of communication with, uh, with other species. It goes well beyond sound. And, and so scientists have to, and, and people studying this, they need a lot of resources. To, to gather the gather the I mean, gather I the think that's one area where I think there are resources. Uh, I think there you know there are several groups, the Jeremy's initiative, which which are really um, getting financed. Uh, you know, there, I, there there are some technical difficulties with that, but I think for some of the higher animals, we're talking about whales, we're talking about primates, probably bats, um, some birds. Um, I, I think we will have a very, very clear understanding of, of what they're saying to each other. Now, whether, we, whether or not, there's another philosophical question. Like if we understand what they're saying to each other, it doesn't necessarily follow that we understand them, right? And, and the more you think about this question, uh, the stranger it becomes for humans, right? Um, that, yeah. that, that and would, I think you must have thought about that a lot when you were writing your book. I, do, I mean, I do. I, I, I certainly did think about the, the Earth Species Project, and the, I mean, the, you know, uh, Wittgenstein. What does he say? If, 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 if a lion could talk, we wouldn't understand him. You know, yeah. the, this idea of it goes beyond this, almost the meaning of of, of, of the words. It, 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 it sort of takes the totality of the species experience that we're which you're trying to understand or you're trying to de decipher. And I think I can imagine. There are there are obvious applications, especially for animals in captivity. If you you know if you offer choice to animals, if you can offer them some way of expressing and understanding what what choices you're offering, then that I, I can see the immediate benefits. I mean, I think they they've done dolphins. You know, do you want a fish or not? Generally, yes. Um, and you know, you can imagine uh, other ways in which in simple choices are given. I I suppose, I suppose my my question is, what's the theory of change behind that? Is it that in hearing the voices of animals, there will naturally come to us more empathy. That we will we will gather a um, a great that that animals will will gather a greater political force, uh, social force, if we can hear their voices. Oh, definitely. Yeah. I mean, I think there are some radical things. I mean, I think that's one very simple point to get across this evening is that we are, regardless of how how much technology we apply. We really are on the cusp of, of an entirely new um, relationship with, a, with other species. And it, it's simply because in myriad ways they can make their presence known to us and then it's harder for us um, to ignore them. You know? 
Yeah, I did, the counter example was given to me was slavery. You know, we did understand, uh, or previous generations understood what slaves were saying, and they just chose to ignore them. And I suppose, I, so. But well, did, uh, did they really? I mean, I know there was a lot of abolitionists who fought for a long time before. So I think right, right people, see, even from the 17th century, were like. They, they had heard the slaves, but they were just like early to the movement. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, when you get into the 19th century, you have abolition. So I, I think it's an interesting question on animal rights. Um, um, I, I think it goes beyond animal rights. I think, you know, animal rights is really function of animals, but we're really talking about species. And, and, and we have this explosion of knowledge in the last 20 or 30 years, where, you know, even our tree of life is being turned on its head, you know. So now we realize that eukaryotes are just a tiny fraction of life on Earth, and you know, mycelial life, and IKEA, and the viruses, and bacteria, and so on. So I, I think that that, that movement is is picking up pace. I don't know exactly how it's going to manifest, but I, th I think the computational relationships uh, with these other species is going to allow us to engage uh, and, uh, as you say, probably not not look away. Mm. I mean, I, I'm personally, um, I'm, I'm, I, see, I see the application of, of AI in in livestock farming and factory farming as a slight dead end. And I think that, you know, our relationship with uh, with livestock has to change for environmental reasons. I think, you know, if you put a, a VR headset on a cow, um, I think it's it's dubious to how much you've, you've experienced, uh, you've changed the experience and, and improved the experience of a cow. And I wonder whether there can ever really be the degree of choice and the, the, the um, over that, over you know the, the choice that we have whether or not to go into a metaverse, that's not what we're offering to a cow. Really, we're saying you know, sorry, do, you're not going to go. So, do you think, Henry, that the interspecies money should flip over into livestock animals, and people, you know, can give a wallet to a cow? Okay, well, let, let, just before we move on to interspecies money, because uh, um, uh, I, but I want to say that the other application of um, of AI is obviously in in pets. And mm. you know, dog training, understanding uh, dog behaviour, and I think there you see a real benefit. And I think that could that could uh, sort of give spillovers um, into into conservation. Um, uh, and it is much less of a dead end, I feel, than than um, than, than AI in the in the livestock industry. Interspecies money, right? Huge, amazing. Um, and um, I, um, how can you? Can you, um, before I come to your question, I'm going to dodge your question for a while. Um, can you, can you say, are you really saying that a giraffe would hold money? Or would, you know, who, are we thinking about a trusteeship here? Are we thinking about a sort of conservatorship where, you know, Brittany the giraffe is, is sort no, of... No, I mean, um, clearly the giraffe physically is not going to hold money, but the, the, the proxy, which is attached to the identity of a giraffe, will hold, hold the money. Uh -huh. And there would be scientists plus the community who would oversee the governance of that distribution. What is really important to to think about is it's perpetual flows of money, but very small amounts of money, you know. So money is going, it's flowing, but it's sort of almost like drip drip feed irrigation, you know. Uh, but I do think uh, and, and, and to be clear, I'm not saying that interspecies money replaces ecosystem services or carbon credits, uh, other forms of biodiversity credit. I am saying that there are a whole range of species who, who are falling between the cracks and will continue to fall between the cracks. So orangutans are a really good example. So that face recognition project. So we, we actually will give orangutan, orangutans wallets. And and the, what will they use the wallet for? Um, well, the problem in Borneo is the orangutans come into conflict with the farmers 
and then they come down the trees and then they raid the crops, you know. And so, first of all, you give the orangutan an identity. And, and secondly, the orangutan, if it raids the farmer's crop, says, oh, I'm really sorry, <laughs> let, me, let me compensate you for that. Um, uh, Where does the money come from initially? Is that, is that, is that the... I mean, that's the missing uh, sort of, or, or, or is it? Is it clear in your in your in your mind where that where the where the money flows to initially from? Well, I think the the initial sort of twenty thirty million that's required to do like pilot testing on you know six six eight species that's difficult, right? Um, but if you prove that, if you prove the idea. Um, it, I'm pretty sure that institutional finance will uh, push very large sums into this. Um, and uh, I spend a lot of my time talking to central banks, and they, they are very interested in thinking through ways to divest large amounts of money into nature. And uh, I, I think central banks will be one of the the main participants in that team. Because at the end of the day, you know, four, five, six billion dollars a year seems a lot of money, but really it's actually not a lot of money if you have six or eight central banks. Um, and as I mentioned, the, the Reserve Bank of India, you know, they, they're committed to increasing uh, biodiversity in India by the 30 or 40 percent by the middle of the century. So I think one of the clear messages here is conservation is, is always been about conserving, you know, and you want to turn it around and say, well, actually, it also should be about regeneration as well, you know. So, so um, I, I think the flow of money it can be very considerable. But I kind of reverse your question and say... If we don't have that flow of money, it's game over in many of those ecosystems. I mean, I showed you the slide of Sierra Leone. Sierra Leone is going to more than double its population by 2050. Mm. It, there's no way in that context without very large um, capital inflows that these other species can make themselves known uh, to say, hey, <laughs> I'm here, I exist. I'd like to hang around. I think it's one of the hardest things for us to get us, uh, our heads around just what is, what is kind of in the pipe, i.e. where we end up on our current trajectory of expansion of the agricultural frontier, expansion of wealth, expansion of population, where that, where that does leave natural spaces, other species, and, and to sort of course correct in time. I think, um, I mean, the, the, the Nadal analogy really did make me think that you know, we have a lot of very over overconfident sort of people on the baseline who who sort of <laughs> think that they can they can uh, you know I'll oh, oh, hit it. He can't serve it that fast. And you know, yeah, in in ten twenty years, the the panorama will completely change, um, and it will be too late to to save some of these species. And I think um, I think you put that you put that um, uh, very well. I um, uh, that if you speak to someone in the NGO world. And I'm going to come to questions in a second about this. Can I give you a version? What I imagine they say is, we're struggling for money as it is. We know the solutions, which is protect, protect wild spaces, you know, uh, create corridors between them, and the animals may follow. You know, use animals as, as kind of ambassadors, as, as, as sort of a pinups, uh, and, with, and, and sort of uh, help the ecosystem base, uh, based on, on their sort of attractiveness and their charisma. Um, we don't have time to think about this. You know, we've got, we don't have time to, to think about technologies that might be ready in 20 years because you know, the pressure on the ecosystems is now. Is, it, yeah. is, that, is, is that what you, you do? That's here? precisely not what they say. I mean, I, I had a call uh, last week with, a, a, you know, I won't name him or his organization, but he was the chief scientist for one of the largest conservation organizations in the world. And he said, um, I'm, I'm praying that your interspecies money works because what I'm doing is a complete waste of time. We achieve nothing and we're not going to achieve anything 
and we need to disintermediate the relationship between money and, and species, you know. Um, very, very large overheads. I mean, it's just worth noting, I mean, like, why on earth am I sitting here in the Royal Institution talking about interspecies money? Even by my standards, this is like a, it's a stretch. But the reason is because, you know, uh, when I w was um, a director of the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology, um, they, uh, IUCN, um, it's major kind of conservation um, quango uh, said, said can you sit on this committee for innovation in conservation finance and I said well I don't know much about conservation and they said well you know a little bit about Africa and so on so I sat on this committee and it was just really clear uh, that they were not going to get it done there was no innovation there was no money and the money that was, was going in overheads for, you know, large salaries in, in Geneva, you know. So, yeah. I think that, the, that we can flip the model completely to have all these young people, 50% of uh, people in sub-Saharan Africa are under the age of 19, you know. Many of them have access to Android phones. Now, I'm not saying that the whole thing is going to be solved because people have got a camera on a phone. But I am saying that if we want to get like really high-resolution awareness of these other species that we cohabit the planet with, um, that we need to include uh, very large numbers of people who, who are really at the end of the road who actually live proximate to those species. You know, and I think along the way we'll discover amazing things. You know, just, I think it'll be quite kaleidoscopic and beautiful. And maybe in reference to your wonderful book, and I just give <laughs> Henry's book a shout out him, but but on the ethical concerns of like how we treat animals, should we eat them? Should we? Why do we keep so many animals captive? You know. Um, and why do we destroy so many animals? I think we will get a wee bit more empathetic as we go. Brilliant. Um, uh, in the sector. And questions from the audience. As a, uh, we have a microphone that will uh, walk around like a... a, a um, um, why don't we st start here with that lady? Um, and then we'll come to you. Thank you. Um, so thank you so much, first of all. And then my question, I think we touched on this. I'm just going to step aside. So in terms of human-wildlife conflict, is there a way we could use technology or harness AI to proactively fight human-wildlife conflict instead of essentially being reactive to that? Therefore, there's obviously a lot of animals living in captivity. And then the funds, uh, if they weren't to stop, they would go towards compensation. But then if they do stop, then there's just no alternative. Um, no, that's a great question. I mean, I think the, the Earth Ranger project that I mentioned is entirely focused on this question of human-wildlife uh, conflict. Because obviously, as, as you say, that when you have these pretty poor uh, communities, they're trying to live off the land, the same land that the species are living off. I mean, I think we can talk about sound, um, you can talk about the use of satellites and, and, and drones, um, and, and also we can develop um, so-called game theory um, uh, approaches. So obviously the, 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 uh, the, the wild is an open system. And game theory is, it should be applied to sort of closed systems. But nevertheless, we can we can predict, you know, where poachers might go. We can predict um, what the community might do in terms of gathering firewood and so on. But there are some harder problems. I don't I haven't seen anything which is very helpful on the bushmeat trade. Yeah, which is basically uh very poor communities sort of wanting extra protein so they're going out to to mm. kill animals. Yeah. 
Yeah, and I think that's probably wildlife crime also comes into play on that as well. Um, thank you. May I have just one quick question? Just one more. Um, do you think that are there these companies with uh, these initiatives, are they connecting with field researchers to get camera trap data and animal monitoring, how they move about in the wild, those are the uh, trapped with collars? Yeah, I mean, uh, there are a lot of projects, but I, I, I'm a little, uh, a little bit down on the big AI companies because they really haven't put a very significant amount of money on the table. So what you tend to find is like you're at Princeton University, they, they have, you know, a professor, she's got like two PhD students, they go out to Botswana, they, they've got $100,000. I mean, they do really interesting stuff and they're proving that the technology is really uh, profound and, and helpful. But, you know, what we actually need is like a thousand fold, you know, scale. You know, and, and we're not seeing that at the moment. Um, gentleman at the back. Hi, um, I'm quite old. Um, I'm a grandfather Are to. You? Yeah, afraid so. A grandfather to three children, um, and I'm worried. Um, I hear about the eight billion population. I hear the lack of success at the COP 26, 27, 28 forecast. I hear about uh, all the other problems about global warming, uh, and I, I just get concerned that. What you're proposing are fantastic ideas, but are we beyond the tipping point? Or do you think that awareness, getting empathy with the animals around us, particularly in the more developing, pop developing countries, are we going to achieve success? Because I hope we can. Oh, thank you, that's a great question. No, I, I, I don't think we're at the tipping point yet. I, I'm, 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 I think the tipping point is probably going to come towards the end of this decade. Um, and what is what is obvious, as I kept emphasizing, is unless we help uh, these very fast-growing poor communities um, to have a higher quality of life um, and, and to uh, cohabit uh, with their surroundings, then then we will look at Annihilation. I mean, I would just cite one example, which is Somalia. I mean, Somalia, if you've been in Somalia in the 1960s, you know, there were probably 2,000 lions in Somalia. There were elephants, there was cheetah, there was an enormous range of, of uh, insect and bird life. And what has happened in Somalia um, since the collapse of of a government there in the early 90s, you know, is, is most of the tree cover has been cut down for charcoal and uh, many, many of the species. I, I, I doubt if there are 10 lions left in the whole of Somalia. And it's not just about lions, but, you know, that, that's indicative of... Um, so, so we know what will happen if we don't put something new and... Uh, you know, re remunerative on, on the ground. Uh, gentleman uh, in the back show. Hi, um, yeah, my question pretty much boils down to um, do you think data will save us? But the my slightly more nuanced version of that would be there seems to be plenty of um, areas of human endeavor where there's no shortage of funding um, and we still do just a phenomenally poor job at prediction, I mean, macroeconomics be one of them. Um, I'm a biological researcher and, you know, any machine learning model that involves causation is still just horrendously poor. You can throw as much data at it as you want and it doesn't do that well. So uh, do we think that just let's collect more and hope that good stuff will come out of that? Or, yeah, is it the funding thing separate from the data? No, that's brilliant. brilliant. You're absolutely right. I mean, I, I, I think... I think my position on that is um, that we need to get, let's say, to 100, 150 million dollars of testing um, on, on multiple ecosystems, and at that point we'll know um, whether uh, knowability is actually knowability. If you know, if you know what I mean. <laughs> like, um, I, I do, I do think. Uh, for many species, just 
you know, it's it's uh, like um, just just being noticed is enough to change their position in the world, right? So just just be aware that they were there. I mean, those you know straw coloured fruit bats that we were talking about, you know. We don't know where they migrate. I mean, that's insane. <laughs> it is literally providing more ecosystem services than any other species in Africa, much more than the elephants. And we don't know where they migrate. Now, that's actually a pretty simple problem, and obviously machine learning will really help with that. And there's probably hundreds of similar problems, but you're... Your, your, your basic underlying point is a really profound one, and there are some really interesting researchers who say the explosion of data basically produces, uh, you know, a, a greater surface area of potential ignorance and, and confusion, you know, um, and and then we'd really be in trouble at that point. Uh, we've got time for the lady in the uh, black jacket. Um. First of all, thank you so much for a fascinating talk and, and also for the conversation. I could listen to the two of you talk uh, forever, and I don't feel like uh, that about many people. So. <laughs> um, but uh, my question is, and I think a couple, um, a couple people touched upon it already, I mean, doesn't it boil down to our values and, and the state of moral progress, really? I mean, you, you talked about the fantastic potential of technology for you know, advancing conservation and, and also you know, just animal welfare when it comes to domesticated animals. Yet, the vast majority of, you know, not just AI, but technology is dedicated to exploiting animals, right? I mean, why is that? It's because us as humans don't really value them enough. And can we, I mean, how can we usher progress in this, in this area? I'm going to let Henry answer that one, because I think your book really is asking that question over and over again, right? It's, I, I mean, um... <laughs> Uh, I, one of the people I speak about in my book, or one of the um, sort of the people I hold up as as having done, you know, a wonderful a wonderful job for our um, for our relationship with animals, is uh, the Tompkins, uh, Doug Tompkins, who's passed away, and um, uh, his wife uh, Chris Tompkins, who um, were uh, well, uh, fashion um, and clothing entrepreneurs slash executives in uh, California. He got forced out, I think, in a boardroom coup. And then um, he thought about a wine collection. He thought that that could be a way of, of blowing a couple of hundred million dollars. Um, and then he decided, instead of that, and instead of uh, Renaissance art, he was going to buy parts of Patagonia and did very successfully. And despite a lot of resistance, and I, he was not interested in animals to start with, but um, despite a lot of resistance, uh, he, did a, you know, he, he, he got this land. He then um, realized that the landscapes were nothing without the animals um, who had uh, lived on it before? Um, this was in Patagonia. In Patagonia, in um, in southern Chile, um, and uh, he he then uh, forged a plan to return that land to the Chilean government, and they've returned land also to the Argentine government to have as national parks. Um, now the Tompkins were completely against technology; you know, they were really skeptical. And I think he, um, uh, at one party, Doug, Doug Tompkins went up to Steve Jobs and berated him about the iPhone. I think, um, and they really, they really had a sort of spiritual connection to the environment and to to animals, which was the you know technology had ripped us apart from that. And I think there's been you know over the past two or three centuries in Europe, there's been this distancing from other animals, animals we would have been up close and personal with every day. We've left them behind. We no longer have the horses in our streets or the, the livestock living on the ground floors of our homes. Uh, you know, we, still, we do have dogs in our bed, but it's a sort of particularly weird relationship with, uh, um, with dogs that we have, uh, I say, as a cat owner. Um, uh, but I, 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 feel that, um, I feel that there is a vision of, that improves our, our relationship with animals, which is a, a sort of anti-technological vision, a, a vision that's very suspicious of, of technological progress. And I, I think the vision that Jonathan's presented is a completely different and, you know, equally compelling vision, which is a, a vision that embraces... They're not, they're not, in, they're not in conflict. I, I don't feel that they're necessarily in conflict. I, we're talking about mediating with the other, right? So the presence of a... Um, you know, if you're a young woman living in Taipei 
and you, you work in a coffee shop, you know, maybe you could have um, some feeling for a, another species in a quite separate and distant ecosystem. And you can really, I mean, I was really struck in one of these, uh, one of your friends probably, Jeremy, one of these big City of London bankers, and he was quite a cynical, hard guy, and we, we were having lunch and talking about this interspecies money, and, and at the end of it, he said, you know what, I really think this is great, because in the, in the end of the day, when I'm on the underground, you know, I could check in, and I could look at this other species, and I could just spend some time when I'm going home uh, in another space, you know. Josh. Great. Yes, please. Uh, 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 thank you. Last question from the gentleman in the T-shirt. Oh, for the audience at home. Uh, my name is Josh. My name is. No, no, sorry. <laughs> yeah. yeah. My name is my name is Joshua, and um, well, I'm friends with Jonathan. I think that it's curious, Henry, that you didn't provoke the discussion about the financialization of nature, given that you work in the Financial Times. So I want to just kind of tee up a question. You're welcome to recast it for Jonathan in whatever uh, frame you want. But it's so curious to me as both a technologist and a financier that we tend to equate the two, that we all agree that technology is something that can allow us to have greater translational potential with living systems. But how can we then conclude that money should be a part of it and that that slips in there as some natural conclusion there? that the financialization of nature will allow us to value nature in such a way that it becomes legible to and ultimately interactable with the economy. And only then will people really care about it because what people really care about is financial value or monetary value. So perhaps you could speculate on an interspecies currency that doesn't necessarily have quantification or doesn't necessarily play with the financial economy, but maybe plays with the economy of intrinsic values, non-instrumental values, or just emotional systems? Because I think that that's really, in the world of biodiversity in which I play, that's really the frontline argument right now, which is, what is the price of putting a price on nature? Do we need to financialize it in order to save it? Does it need to become legible to the human economy for it to become meaningful and for us to preserve it? And if so, is that just an advancement of neoliberalism into all of life? Well, I think you know my position on that, which is... All oh, right, yeah, well, I think... You know, obviously there's a lot of economic theory that money is just memory. So money is what we want to remember. And, you know, other species have no money because, you know, and because they have no money, they're not very well remembered in our economy, you know. Um, and... I think that, uh, as you know very well, Joshua, the, the nature of money itself is is mutating. So uh, we, we have these central bank digital currencies, which, you know, there'll be money, but there'll also be a means for government to to reach the poorest people in the in in society. You know, I'm never going to persuade uh, a neo-Marxist that this is a good idea. But I would take the counter view that, that actually you're corrupting, uh, you're corrupting the capitalist system by bringing nature into the system, right? Like, it's going the other way. And don't forget that, 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 that you know, in this, this idea, there is definitely a, a, a separate governance question, right? Because, obviously... It is the proxy of the animal, not the animal itself, but nevertheless, the interests of the animal are represented, which is very different from a traditional kind of conservation program. But, you know, I think that th these discussions, what, what do you think, Henry? I mean, this yeah, is the, that is the sort of, uh, that is the crux of the debate within um, sort of environmentally minded economics, right? I mean, one would be the environmental, the, the sort of mainstream view is if you don't place a value on these assets, they're valued at zero in the economy. And, you know, you can suck in or, 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 or pump out resources um, with, with um, malign 
side effects, and you don't pay, you don't pay, and you don't worry about the the impact. And the yeah, the the counter argument is we just have values, and I believe that we do have values to, uh, um, in regards to to animals. That you know, we think of. Uh, my book is about how we think of ourselves as animal lovers. How you know, I read countless celebrity interviews where people say, oh, "I love animals," and then I always think, "Well, what are you doing about it?" Um, and I really think that the way we, I can't see another way in which we instrumentalize those values that, that doesn't go through our wallets and doesn't go through a way of, of constant financial flows, really. And that's why I think new ways of, 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 of finding those flows and of, um, of, of making those uh, sort of emotionally relevant to people and emotionally engaging to people is very exciting. I do, I do want to say finally that I did have a thought that if, if it were, if the, if the giraffe themselves, and I can round off on this crass thought, if it's all right, Jonathan. Oh, be crass. If the giraffe themselves, <laughs> if they got the money, then presumably the first thing they would do is pay for a hunter on the, on the lions, would they? Would they, they, they <laughs> um, but thankfully it's in their interest not to, for, the, for the ecosystem not to collapse. Look, uh, you've been a wonderful audience. Thank you very much for the questions and for sitting through. Jonathan, thank you so much. Um, <laughs> I would like to say thank you to the uh, Czech Centre London, thank you to the Royal Institution for having us, and for everyone who's been involved in the event. Um, thank you. And uh, uh, Premsel, I don't know whether you want to say something finally. but um. uh, No, I just would like to echo what you were saying. Really a huge thing. thank you for this fascinating discussion and food of thoughts. Uh, I would say continued discussion. I really would like to invite all of you here, uh, maybe for a... Uh, uh, brief drinks, uh, specifically for, for Czech beer, and we can continue the discussion here. Uh, thank you for coming, and thank you again, gentlemen. This was wonderful.